Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. First, to quickly introduce the Expert Network Team, here's Carl Frank. Thanks, Mike. My name is Carl Frank with AI Financial Services. We work with a small number of successful families to help you grow and protect your investments and choose how you want to be taxed. Now let me introduce Jeff Cromendike. Thanks, Carl. Jeff Cromendike with Security First Insurance Agency, where we exist to build long-term mutually beneficial relationships with business owners as well as household members in helping them transfer and manage their risk. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Jeff. This is Mike Miller with Miller & Associates CPAs. We're a small firm specializing, uh, working with small businesses and individuals to help them become tax compliant and tax efficient uh, and help them prepare and manage their financial statements accordingly so they understand how their business is being run. We try really hard to make sure that we put more money in people's pockets rather than in the government. Uh, next up, Nate. I'm Nathan Merrill. I am a founding partner of Goodspeed and Merrill. Uh, Goodspeed and Merrill is a law firm located in the Denver Tech Center, a uh, small uh, small business, full service oriented, as well as private client. My emphasis is on uh, strategic tax planning, helping make sure people keep more of what they make so they can make more out of what they keep. Um, now I'll turn the time back over to Carl. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. We encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us with the Expert Network Team Podcast. Today, our topic is estate planning basics. My name is Carl Frank, and with me today is Nathan Merrill. Thank you for being here, Nathan. Not a problem. Happy to be here. Well, I'm looking forward to this one in particular because we are all going to reach the end of our life at some point in time, and some of us will be more prepared than others. Yeah, what do they say? It's uh, the, th- is it three things you can count on our death, change, and taxes? <laughs> Well, here we go. Let's talk about death. And if we get it prepared, maybe it won't be quite as unpleasant. So, Nate, when you think about estate planning, what does that mean to you? What does it entail? Is it just drafting a last will and testament? What What is this? Well, that's certainly a key component of it. The You're exactly right in, in the sense that when people think of putting their estate together, they think of Um, dying and transitioning their assets, their wealth to their family. But the estate of a person is much broader than just what they own at death. And so when we talk about estate planning, um, we're actually talking about, you know, pre-end of life situations. Um, Certainly what, how we handle the transition at death. And then estate planning doesn't necessarily need to be just around the transfer of assets, it can contemplate a duration of period that is technically into perpetuity. So planning for your estate could involve setting up documents and instruments that take effect and have impact beyond your life, beyond the life of your children, you know, that sort of thing. So So what are these documents that you're talking about? uh, Well, starting at the kind of the the front end and working our way back through them, you have at the front end, you have um, documents that take impact or have impact or take effect while you're still living. And those are the powers of attorney. And we have an entirely separate podcast that does delve into those issues of what is a power of attorney? What are the major considerations that come into play when you're putting that together? But your powers of attorney are your general power of attorney, also called a financial power of attorney. And that deals with your stuff. And then you have a medical power of attorney, which deals with your person, um, your medical care, your placement and facilities while you are still alive. So these documents have importance while you are still alive. You're not dead yet when these documents come into play. And and they are durable in the sense that they will last while you are incapacitated. So some powers may suspend at the point you have developed an incapacity. These documents in, in a typical estate plan are designed to last you until the moment of your death. 
Got it. At so, which point, a common misconception is at that point they no longer have power or effect. That's when your will um, takes effect. Is the will only has any sort of importance or relevance at the point you die? Got it. So before that, the powers of attorney, and then after death, uh, is the, you got a will. Is the will the one that spans them both? The the other part of a sometimes complete estate plan is a trust. A trust can be established while you're alive. Um, and to the extent it's you transfer assets to that trust, it will manage the assets while you're alive, and then it will manage those assets through your death. So of the two, you know, similar in imp- importance while you're alive, it has impact and relevance while you are incapacitated and while you're still living, but it also handles the same functions as a will at death and transfers assets um, to the way you want them to pass to heirs and beneficiaries at that point. So we've got powers of attorney, we've got a will, we've got trusts. What other documents should I know about? Uh, HIPAA release, getting uh, granting authority to persons who don't necessarily want authority to make decisions on your behalf. Mm. But you know the common situation I describe is you know, where you end up in the hospital and everybody gathers around at the hospital, first and foremost is can they even find out what hospital you're in? Technically, hospitals are not supposed to disclose too much information about what's going on with right. you, where you're located, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. So the the HIPAA release, the Patient Information Protection Act, or whatever it was called, Health Information Patient Protection Act, um, allows you to give to other people authority to start to inquire and get information about your health situation. And that, that is good in a couple of ways. It, it makes sure that the anxiety and and chaos that sometimes surrounds those events is, is mitigated. And it also makes it so that everybody doesn't have to go through one person, so that uh. one person's job isn't consumed with having to channel information right. to the to play telephone for siblings and yeah mm-hmm. i mean that that can sometimes be really frustrating tasking you know well did you ask them this did right. you ask them that privacy well, is so important but there are definitely some side effects to yeah that, and we've seen that in our yeah. own family and I've, and I've heard stories so the the hipaa release is one and and we those can be customized to take effect we sometimes will customize those to apply to children provided that they've reached a certain age uh-huh. because you don't want to yeah burden a, a child burden them or they, they just may but not have the emotional or maturity to to deal with finding out that yeah what mom or dad has are. terminal cancer or something mm-hmm. like that and having to not having but feeling compelled that they need to go talk to the doctor to get the answers at that point you want to kind of filter it through you know, more mature persons. So that's one. Other estate plan documents uh, that I didn't mention, the living will, advanced medical directives. This is the document. Um, most people who are familiar with this document understand its origins were in the Terry Shrivo case in Florida where Very famous. she was uh, in a persistent vegetative state. She was mm-hmm. in a coma on life support. And, um, Very sad. And, uh, yeah, and her husband... Um, after I think over a year, if not more on this life support, he wanted to, um, let her her pass Mm -hmm. and, um, her parents did not want to let her go and there was no other way to determine. I mean, they had to fight in the courts about who had authority to Mm -hmm. withdraw to make the decision. And it wasn't even withdrawing life support. They, they got past the life support issue. It was the artificial hydration and nutrition that ultimately Mm -hmm. was the problem because they took her off life support and her brain stem or something, I don't, I'm not a doctor, I just play one on TV, um, kept her organs functioning. And mm-hmm. so the only reason she was alive or maintaining life was because of the artificial hydration and nutrition. And that's mm-hmm. not typically viewed as a medical yeah. procedure. And so therefore, um, to withdraw that, you, you kind of had... It gets into this who whole... Had the, who had the authority of pulling the cracks. Exactly. My goodness. So... So the living will is important in that regard. Um, it helps set forth your wishes and make sure that those types of... Events are handled. Exactly. Yeah, so I can rest easy. What about uh, my stuff? What about... Yeah, so that's a fun one because back in the day, if you read some of the old wills from you know over a century mm-hmm. ago, um, before statutory enhancements that we have nowadays were in effect, if you wanted to give your 
rings to one yeah. daughter and your mm-hmm. collector, you know, yeah. collections to someone else. You had to actually list that stuff out in your will. You change your mind. You have to redo your will or at least do right. a codicil to it. Um, fortunately, we don't have to do that anymore. So most wills and trusts will now incorporate what's called a personal property memorandum where you can list out the things you want to give to specific people if you care. Um, this is ironically, some people care a lot. Some people care not at all. And there's almost no one in between. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of truth. So, uh, and, and we can, we often help people evaluate kind of how they go about finding out what their children want. There's some fun games you can play around the house with post-its or little colored dots, people indicating the mm-hmm. interest of what Which they one have. they want, yep. Because even if you do say, I want this to go to such and such a person, there's always that fight that comes up afterwards where they said, no, no, I really, really wanted that. Right. Mom had no idea because right. I didn't let her know. And then the, you're in a... Emotions just go yeah. wild. All, so it's, in, it goes along with the, as much communication as is appropriate is desirable. Like if you can communicate with family and right. have these conversations, even though they may be tough regarding end of life, uh, the more communication typically in a healthy functioning family will produce a better result when it comes to estate administration. So. Communication is the key. Mm-hmm. I think understanding these phrases are, are important too. Wills and trusts, uh, wills and revocable trusts. What are the differences? Um, so like I said, a will, there's a saying that goes with wills, where there's a will, there's probate. Uh-huh. What that means is, like I said before, a will doesn't have any legal effect until you die. A will assumes that you own everything in your own name, so that be your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts, your home, your cars, all that stuff is titled in your name. And legally, in order to transfer those assets to someone else, there has to be a title transfer that occurs. And the no one's authorized. Like I said, the powers of attorney cease on your death. So the only way to get authority to transfer those assets to whoever you've designated them to go to, be it in a will, is through a personal representative. That personal representative is given authority by the court, who oversees this process, to actually take those assets, change the title, and give it to whoever you wanted it to go to. This doesn't happen automatically by itself. So that's what a will does. That's what probate is. They go hand in hand. Where one exists, the other exists. Got it. Trusts are a little bit different because a trust is an entity similar to like you would think of as a company or something like that's an entity that exists now and has legal importance or legal effect now. So you establish a trust to the extent you put assets in in the name of that trust, meaning you transfer those assets to the trust, you deed your house to the trust, you buy your car, you, you establish bank accounts in the name of the trust. The trust owns those assets. And even though you may die as a trustee, the trust never dies and therefore probates never required with respect to the trust. We just progress through the trust and go from trustee to trustee succession and at different stages in that document such as death for example when i die i want my trustee to change its function from taking care of me to distributing assets to other people and those that could be outright distributions or it could be further distributions or maintenance and trust and that trust can continue on similar to how wills will often set up trusts trusts can create new trusts and those trusts can create new right. trusts and we can keep this ball rolling for as long as you want. So I think I've got it, but give me some more detail. Let me let me in behind the scenes. Why would I want a, a trust over a will? What are some of the advantages? Um, well, the uh, the probate process can sometimes mm. be... Daunting? A burden... So, well, daunting, yes. In Colorado, fortunately, where we are recording this podcast... Um, fortunately, the laws are relatively streamlined. The process is relatively streamlined. So where Good. it used to be a burdensome, costly process, I usually don't advance that as a reason to mm-hmm. avoid probate. Um, there may be some cases, I'll start with the reasons why you might want to do, use a will or have a will and probate apply okay. to your estate yeah. plan. And that's because you do kind of get that outside oversight that a court uh, or someone a else is is monitoring what's going on. Right. So if you've struggled with the idea of who would I and granted you can require a court supervised trust administration too but it's it's part of the probate process so that that's one area where you might want a will the other area where you might want a will is if you you if if your option is between a trust and a will 
you set up a trust, you actually have to transfer the assets to that trust. It right, you actually have to do some work. You have to do some work. So you're mm-hmm. basically pre-administering your estate is how I often describe it. So oh, you're taking some time in your golden years to actually move the assets into a vehicle mm-hmm. that will make it easier for your heirs to... Extra paperwork. ...to do that. But it is extra paperwork. It's extra work, and you often miss things. And so... Um, that's a reason not to do a trust, right. but to just rely just on the will, the will to just catch everything and run it through yeah, probate. Keep it simple, silly. The reasons why you might want to, I'd say the reasons for a trust, um, not necessarily in completely in order of priority are, um, privacy. Yeah. Um, with a probate, you're filing court records, you're filing inventories, you're filing schedules of distributions, depending on how the the administration of the probate is handled, those may or may not be available to the public in general. At the very least, they'll know who beneficiaries of the estate are and why privacy matters in that regard is uh, there are people who understand how the system works and they may begin to prey on your beneficiaries recognizing that they just won the lottery or they think they won the lottery. I mean, think of how much junk mail you get whenever you get a mortgage or something like that. That's because it's public record that a deed of trust was just filed with respect to your house. They know that you just bought a home, bought a home, got, got extra money, cashed out, whatever. The same type of thing will happen with respect to probate filings. They find out who's listed as an interested party. Right. And they'll start getting Trust junk mail. Keep it private. Yeah. Uh, another uh, reason to to uh, move towards a revocable trust is if you own more than more pro- if you own property in more than one state. Uh, so like a family cottage up in Wisconsin, but I live here in Denver. Yeah, I know you've never invited me up, so I don't <laughs> know that you have that. I don't actually okay. have it, but wouldn't it be nice <laughs> if I did? On Wisconsin, lake, sure. I guess Wisconsin is nice enough. It'd be beautiful. Um, let's go. Yeah. So, and, and, and the often missed one is maybe you don't have that lovely cottage on Lake Champlain. Um, I picked Vermont instead of Wisconsin. So maybe that's not you, but you may have had a timeshare that you purchased on a trip to Florida. And if it's deeded, right. If it's deeded real estate, which a a lot of times, the newer ones aren't necessarily deeded real estate. They're point systems, and you okay. kind of have a membership as opposed to actual real estate. But if you own a deeded trust timeshare, which is mm. most timeshares before the year 2000, then um, that's real estate is in that Florida. Right? Hmm. So that would require – and the reason why that's a problem um, is uh, you have to probate where you own real property. So you now – now you got to file probate in Florida. Now you got to do probate in Colorado, probate in Florida. Want. Your mom left you some land that's been in the family for 10 years up in sure. North Dakota. You have sure. to do it there. So the probate is the reason why you would do a trust if you have real property in more than one jurisdiction. There's yeah. there's ways around that. Um, and, and we'd certainly counsel clients to um, how to avoid the probate in multiple states other than a trust. The other way is to basically put it into an LLC or something like that. And then mm-hmm. you own the LLC in your own name. Um, and, and it can be basically consolidated. So whether it's an LLC or a trust, what you're doing is you're moving that ownership to just one jurisdiction. It makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? Yes. So, um, so in property in more than one state, then, then using the LLC as a, as a segue when you own business interests, if you right. are investing with partners in real estate or have a business interest or something like that, and you don't want to run that business interest through probate for a number Countless of reasons, reasons. Um, it's just easier to manage business interests through a trust ownership sure structure. Be, so that's another one. Um, even before death, a reason why a trust might be a desirable instrument is um, the difference between powers of attorney and revocable trust is a power of attorney is an agent, meaning they execute the directions of the principal. If you have an incapacity such as dementia or Alzheimer's, sometimes you don't have a lot of confidence in what the intent or desire of the principal is. Sure. And therefore, you can find yourselves in a bit of a quandary on what do I do? A classic example, and I've actually had this come up with the client, is um, they were the agent and their uh, I think it was their aunt, so it wasn't even a, a direct relation, it needed to be placed in a, a long-term care facility. She had Alzheimer's or dementia. She was certainly losing capacity. And she said to the agent, the niece, as she was 
going into the facility. Whatever you do, don't sell my house. Mm. But the only way to pay for the facility was to sell the sell house. Sell the home. So, um, so she was in a bit of a quandary of, do I act outside my capacity, sell the home, and hope that she doesn't come back or yeah. her children don't come back and sue me because I breached her so expressed cool. desire? Because, you know, she was telling everybody, oh, I'm not going to be here long. I'm going back to my home. Mm-hmm. And and certainly she ended up not. And the, fortunately, in that case, it, it, it wasn't much of a problem. But in the case of a, a trust, that fiduciary, the trustee, can act in the best interests of the beneficiary and isn't bound by the express direction of the beneficiary. So you can do things that are in her best interest, that are in her best interest and help you to have more flexibility to manage. That's a great, great, great point. And it leads right in, I think into the, one of the next questions that I have, which is some of the issues that I should be thinking about as I put together my estate plan. Uh, you once told me that equality isn't the same thing as fairness. What does that mean? Um, well, I, I'll st- It basically means that um, there's a strong tendency to want to treat everybody the same. Right. But when we're honest with ourselves, well, yes, uh, it sounds fair. That that would be equality. If you treat everybody the same, everybody has the same outcome. What sounds fair is not necessarily equal or what's equal is not necessarily fair. And the reason for that is in the example I give, and this is an an actual client that I worked with, um, they had a son who was very, very successful um, to the tune of, you know, half a billion dollars in net oh worth. Goodness. And um, he did not have the same need uh-huh. arising sure. out of, of, of an inheritance. inheritance that, what does he need for money? That They also right. had a child that had Asperger's oh and goodness. would definitely require would financial assistance. Help. Well, that's so, a really dramatic example. So fair, yes, and and this is not uncommon. I mean, maybe not everybody has a son <laughs> with worth a half a billion, but some some kids are more financially successful than others. That's exactly right, and that's some have common. different aptitudes than others. Health needs is mm-hmm. is the most common one that comes up is where yeah. where a child has has been hindered in their ability to accumulate wealth mm. because of ongoing health sure. concerns throughout their life, yeah. and a parent may want to provide for greater support for that child. Well, that just seems the right thing to do. Right. right? But that wouldn't be... And we see this a lot in, in, the, in the context mm-hmm. of special needs planning as well, with sure. autism, um, Asperger's, uh, Down syndrome, mm-hmm. any, any type of developmental disability. And I hope those siblings would Where you may have that. typically developing siblings right. is equal fair. Right, and it might not be. Right. Yeah, that's a really so, good point. Now I get it. And so those are extreme examples, but the same may be true... In other areas as well, you you don't. There's no moral requirement that you distribute your estate outright Mm -hmm. in equal shares to everybody the same way. Um, That's what what I often mean by that makes what's equal is not always fair, and what's fair is not always equal because you have. This is, you know, I'm working with clients. It's their wealth. It's their accumulated. assets and they should do what they feel is best and not feel obligated to anybody right. on how they create their estate plan and who they leave stuff to it goes back to communication. If they have a concern that people are going to view it as wrong, then you may need to have a conversation with that child or that potential beneficiary as to why they feel they have a, a right or an interest in your property when it was not theirs to begin with, right? You so know, you make a great point there, and, and I, I, I guess you know I think about the not everybody. In fact, hardly anybody is going to have a child who's as successful as the one you just mentioned. But a lot of people might have kids who have the opposite problem. Maybe they have creditor problems. How can we plan an estate? When maybe one of my kids is not doing well financially and the other ones are? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about creditors because um, that's creditor protection is one of the main reasons why folks will lean towards leaving assets to a child in trust. Is that right? So that's the way we, that we address concerns about creditors. But um, trusts are usually invoked in a number of situations as a primary tool, and that's to avoid the impact of, we, you know, lawyers are not often accused of of being simple 
yeah. in terms of how we express yeah, things. Yeah, sometimes we, it gets more complex than... We've tried to simplify this one, <laughs> and, and, and it's to protect against predators, creditors, and themselves. Oh, I like it. Um, predators, we've talked a little bit about with, with Wills, um, mm-hmm. but predators could be their posse, you know, uh, the people they hang right. out with. Mm-hmm. You know, once they see, hey, you just inherited... Right. A nice uh, mint from your go buy me something. parents. Yeah, let's go have a party. Let's 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 mm-hmm. because you know it's mine too. No, um, so that's one of the areas is predators. Creditors could be their. Um, you can you can protect it or isolate it from their own contractual creditors. The the credit cards they run up, um, and this is not to assume that everybody's spendthrift. So that you know we hope that. A lot of people are raising their kids to be financially literate. As and, much as we can. And um, that sort of thing. But but if they're starting a business, the mm-hmm. SBA takes your right. firstborn son um, or daughter. Mm-hmm. And so those creditor exposures can be protected against. Your mortgage. We saw a lot of people get underwater yeah. during the financial crisis 2008, 2009. And there's technically a deficiency that can arise out of a mortgage. If you don't. If your property loses value below the value of your mortgage, um, no fault of your you own, problem. except for maybe you were speculating or something like that. But you can protect the assets against those types of creditors. You may have a son that never really got the hang of driving, and anybody he can potentially hit driving down the street is a creditor of his. Um, so tort, um, one of the lesser understood or lesser recognized torts, you could have the most responsible child in the world. They could be a brain surgeon or spinal surgeon. Let's pick spinal surgeon. And they have something occur on the operating table that results in a medical liability to Mm -hmm. them, medical malpractice. And now they have creditors that you didn't anticipate because you didn't know they were going to be a spinal surgeon. Of course you didn't. So there's those types of liabilities. So, So there's contract, there's tort. And then my favorite, which is because of the reaction it usually garners from folks is spouses. Ah, uh, marriage, so, right. So, because everybody loves their daughter-in-law mm-hmm. or son-in-law, right? Everybody <laughs> thinks that they're the criminal. I've actually only had one client who says, well, if my son gets divorced, it's probably his fault. So, <laughs> so the, she, she, she should be entitled to half of his stuff, even if it's mine. I really <laughs> like her. I've only had one client say that over the years. Um, so, so the other reason that people invoke trusts is to protect their inheritance from the claims of right. a divorcing spouse. Yeah. And that's big because that's a 50% creditor in, in most states. You can think of it as like 50% off the top. If it gets commingled in that Seems marital that estate, half it's... Is, yeah. Half is, so those are... Is marital. I don't, I don't want to suggest that people's marriages won't work out, but these statistics are basically at 50% right now. Mm, terrible. Yep. So, so tell me a little bit about that trust. That's a way that I can protect in all those situations. But... But what is this trust? Aren't I just trying to control things beyond the grave? Uh, that may be the case for some, but it's not necessarily. So a trust should be viewed simply as a mechanism to suspend the receipt of the property in, in okay. the, outside of the person's estate. So um, you may be able to provide them all the same benefits as them owning it outright. Mm. But we're going back to our prior Topic, which is credit asset protection, as long as they don't own it directly, right? It's it can be uh, enhanced credit. So that's protection. an additional gift, really. Correct. It's, it's insurance you can't really buy. Is um, so it, it it can and should be viewed as as a benefit when, when something's suspended in trust for a beneficiary as something that's technically being done for their benefit. That's why they're the beneficiary. Um, Trust can have appended to them all sorts of conditions. And so there's there's certainly um, penalty or behavioral modification trust is what they used to be called, where you say, I want my son to do this, that, and the other like thing. Like perhaps go to college or... Yeah, and those can be done in a behavioral modification way or an incentive way. Okay. And, and it may be splitting hairs there, but... You can say he doesn't get anything until he graduates from college. Or you can say if he does this, that, or the other, then he gets he gets right. college paid for, he gets enhanced benefits. You can you can design these things to lead your beneficiaries to engage in activities that you feel will enhance their lives, help make them productive, 
um, help facilitate their growth and development and and quality of life without um, it being a hammer. It could be more of a, a leading um, opportunity where you're basically just saying if you're if you're going to go spend it on cars, you know, wine, right. song, and women, or whatever the the phrase is, mm. I don't want any part of that. But yeah. if you're going to go travel with family, I'm more than happy to help you you know pay for trips to go travel with family if you're going to travel to disneyland i mean i'm not bagging disneyland or anything but some people would say they can pay for that on their own dime but if they want to go to the louvre right i i purposely pronounce that slaughtering my french um i want to support you getting those kind of life enhancing experiences quality of life experience um, if you're going to go sit on a beach for a week, pay for that on, on, on your, your own, own dime. Yeah. If you want to go on some sort of educational experience or, you know, people can define that themselves, what they want their kids to be able to get from it in terms of benefit. The other thing is you have to understand or recognize there's potential unintended consequences of trust, which is we've all heard the phrase trust fund baby yeah right um, entitlement mentality i hear that all the time right so you definitely want to do things if that's a concern for you if you'd hate to to you know come back and see your children in a situation of total dependency on the trust where mm. they haven't developed their own potential they haven't pursued they don't have their confidence they haven't the abilities right so those areas you can certainly factor into how you design your trust too making sure that they don't have just a a trust teat that they can live off of where there's a constant supply of money. Some trusts are, are so well-funded that it's hard not to create some sort of um, income element to them. But there you want to make sure that you're still continuing to incentivize for greater participation or greater realization of benefit from the trust that they they are doing what they can to develop their own talents and abilities there's a there's a lot of social science out there on on trusts and they can certainly be viewed negatively on both ends that if if the trust by its very existence creates a dependency that's not a good thing but it's the lottery winning syndrome on the other side if you just leave an inheritance outright to a beneficiary the social science the the statistics show that they'll probably squander it within three to five years following that they end up back in the same exact position within three to five years of getting the windfall it's true of lottery winners it's true of inheritances it's true of a lot of different things i, I tell you Nate, my my experience with trust my clients in the beneficiaries and the, and the students i've had great success with trust and i've had more success stories than failures with trust I, i've i've just seen young folks blossom when their college education is paid for and when they're going to a trustee and saying, can I have a few thousand dollars to, you know, to spend in a responsible way? And it's brought families together. This has been the experiences that I've seen over and over again. I've seen trusts work wonders. So just taking a break a little bit from our presentation, I want to take a few minutes here to introduce one of our expert team members. I'm here with Jeff Cromendike. Uh, Jeff is a, uh, one of the owners of Security First Insurance Agency. Jeff, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Security First and what it is you do for your clients? Yeah, thanks, Nate. Thanks for having me, and it's a privilege to be a part of this uh, expert team um, and bring the uh, expertise uh, from our um, perspective. Uh, again, uh, I founded Security First Insurance Agency along with my partner, Tim Van Denen, about 15 years ago. And uh, we are a um, property and casualty uh, insurance uh, agency. We uh, focus on um, business that is domiciled here up and down the front range of Colorado, um, primarily small and medium-sized uh, commercial business as well as um, household uh, risk as well. We really um, see ourselves as risk managers, not just um, uh, a brokerage or an agent that allows others access to the insurance markets, but uh, take a um, very um, uh, detailed uh, approach to managing risk, um, evaluating risk, uh, really um, doing an, an evaluation of, um, of all the different uh, aspect, aspects of risk, and then 
um, focusing on transferring that risk to insurance companies. So how would you say that uh, your clients or customers who are considering moving their insurance could benefit from a relationship with, with Security First? Sure. Yeah, first of all, we, uh, we do have a, a wide range of insurance uh, markets available to us. So uh, we're appointed uh, directly by uh, over 150 different insurance companies. So it gives us really a, a broad um, brush perspective on the insurance products that are available out there. And uh, really, we, we start from the, the, from really just the foundation of trying to understand exactly what the exposures are, um, what the needs of the clients are specific to the things that they're concerned with, and then um, really work hard in communicating to them, educating the client with regards to what their exposures are and how those exposures can be transferred through a contract um, called an insurance policy to an insurance carrier. And uh, we do that in a, in a manner that, uh, first of all, makes them aware of their, their needs, but also then provides them with a uh, competitive solution to transferring that risk. Yeah. I know that since we moved uh, over to you guys and had you start handling our accounts, it's been uh, a much smoother, much more confident process that we we have confidence that we're covered and that, that our needs are being met and, and certainly very responsive team you have over there. Um, given that you've been part of the expert team since inception, where do you feel the expert team really adds value to the services you provide to your clients? Yeah, it's no secret that we're in one of the most competitive verticals uh, really in the marketplace today. Um, there's an, uh, an absolute um, abundance of insurance agencies, insurance uh, companies. Um, our, our choices as consumers in the insurance market certainly are abundant. And so we're always looking for ways to differentiate ourselves and set us apart from um, the other uh, options or yeah, other other agencies and that are out there, and so when we bring um, uh, services to a client, we want to definitely make sure that we're bringing value. And even if it's in an area that we're not experts in, we want to make sure that our clients um, feel like uh, we are uh, somewhat of the hub of the wheel. Uh, that uh, in the event they're in need of um, you know legal advice, uh, we can refer them um, to Goodspeed and Merrill if they're in need of. Uh, tax help or accounting uh, assistance. Um, Miller & Associates is, is right there and available to, to help our clients and then uh, as well as uh, investment advice um, and, and certainly retirement, things like that. Um, A&I Financial has always um, been um, a great, great outlet for our clients and I think together um, we you know really kind of create a four-legged stool uh, approach to uh, being able to create a, a, a really good platform for our clients to um, have all of their financial and professional services um, provided. Excellent. And, and uh, realizing that we understand that insurance makes the world go round, uh, when you're not doing insurance, what is it that makes uh, Jeff unique and, and interesting as an individual? Yeah, thank goodness there is life outside of insurance. Um, and so I... Um, I'm uh, first, first and foremost um, a, uh, a husband uh, of uh, 24 years um, and then also a, a dad of 18 years. So I've got two, uh, two boys and uh, they're just uh, a lot of fun to be around. So really whatever they're into, I'm into. Um, we do a lot of uh, skiing in the winter, um, hiking and, and mountain biking in the summer. Um, we. Uh, just really enjoy being with with one another, and um, uh, just really that's uh, that's what I, I I live for. So um, very very privileged and and um, blessed to uh, to have a great wife and, and two awesome boys. Well, we're also very blessed and uh, grateful to have you as part of the expert team. And uh, with, uh, without much further ado, we'll return to our our program. You can design trusts. So the, the functional components of a trust, you have the corpus, the principle, 
the asset, which okay. uh, on that side, that's where you get involved as a, as a wealth manager is making sure it's properly invested. It's growing over time. When you right. consider the time value of growth and what that can mean to someone mm-hmm. down the road, if it's not squandered in three to five years, exactly. what that could mean for their quality of life, that that's huge. Um, but so you have the trustee who's the one in charge of managing all those decisions. That can uh-huh. be one person. It can be several people. Okay. Um, that's where a lot of our counsel with clients comes into play is helping them see how to achieve their objectives because they're like the power of attorney. It's a can become a job in and of itself. Good there man. are professional fiduciaries out there. There are mm-hmm. trust companies. There, there are ways to address the mm-hmm. burdensome side of it and limit the roles that personal family members might have to play. You can limit their role to just simply making decisions about distributions, leaving the investment powers to someone else, administrative powers to someone else. You, you can break up the responsibilities so that so that it's not a huge ordeal for someone. And then where it's appropriate, you can involve other family members as what I call, uh, especially for younger, uh, when, when there's a potential for trust beneficiaries to be younger, and they don't have that life experience and the sophistication to know how it exactly works right. and say right. to the trustee, hey, mm-hmm. I need this distribution. Mm-hmm. We call them beneficiary advocates. Ah. They're a non-fiduciary role, but it may be the aunt, uncle, guardian, or former guardian who right. knows the beneficiary and can advocate on behalf of the beneficiary mm-hmm. and say to the trustee, hey, uh, John needs a distribution because he's right. barely scraping it together out of college. Just Alternatively, for a trustee decisions. who may be a professional and doesn't have that personal relationship with the beneficiary, the beneficiary advocate can help be a sounding board for some requests that are coming through. They say, hey, you know, Johnny's been asking for these large distributions. Do you know what's going on? And is, I mean, can you give me some insight as to what's going on? And beneficiary advocate can be like, yeah, he's depressed. Mm. And... Uh, I don't know that it's a great idea to to be sending him all this money because who knows what he's doing with it. We should probably have an intervention or something. But, you know, they can they can provide real life context for things that are happening in a vacuum otherwise. So there's there's different ways to put these trusts together to make sure that there's a support network around how this money because money is just a medium. Right. It's just a medium. It doesn't make it doesn't make the unwise wise. It doesn't make the fiscally um, spendthrift into prudent investors. Sure doesn't. There's, we have to put context around mm. an inheritance to make sure that wealth can have an impact, whether it be just one generation you're concerned about or if you want a multi-generational impact. We have to put context around how that medium of assets or money is to be handled. And, and further to the point on trust, and I don't know how far we've gotten off the last topic but trusts are the vehicle by which you can make sure that assets do pass down through multiple generations so if you have that family cabin up in wisconsin right or on the um shores of lake champlain in vermont you can set up a structure that will make sure that that asset stays in the family so to Mm. speak as long as possible I love it. Now, if I have a trust, just on a practical note, and then I'd love to come back to your deeper thoughts on money, but um, if I have a trust and I'm the inheritor of this trust, I'm the the recipient of this trust, do I have to shut it down at some age? Can I keep it for the rest of my life? Can my kids inherit it? How does that work? So, there, yeah, there used to be a rule called the rule against perpetuities. And it was based on the the wisdom of very long gone people that it was a bad idea to tie up property into perpetuity, meaning that you could put restrictions on a property that would make it um, either non-transferable or would impair its value for an extended period of time. So the rule against perpetuities would typically limit your ability to tie up property. Um, the, the rule was stated as a life and being plus 21 years at the time of the creation of the interest. So it was basically... You know, give or take a hundred and so years that you could tie a property. Well, most of those laws have been statutorily repealed. So there, there are still some applications of the rule against perpetuities, but by and large, you can set up a trust to extend into perpetuity, provided that you don't restrict either the alienation of the property, meaning it can't be sold. Um, you have to create some ability for it to be turned over at some point, 
in somebody's discretion, call it a trustee for simple um, discussion. So if the trustee has the power to sell or exchange or, or dispose of the property, then generally in most states you're going to be into the perpetuities. Some states have limitations that are either 100 years or 1,000 years or something like that. But um, 1,000 years, I think, is for those that haven't completely repealed it, it's usually around 1,000 years. But where are we going to be in 1,000 years? I mean, it's basically yeah, into it's perpetuity. Irrelevant. That's yeah. a perpetuity. So, so effectively, so, I, I can get the benefits of having asset protection. I can still get use of my assets. I can keep it professionally invested. I can even have a trustee. And, and I don't necessarily have to get rid of it. But I could, in a lot of cases, once I reach a certain age and meet the qualifications that the creator of the trust has set in place. Yeah, so even though we may do perpetuity trusts, we often put in there safety latches that allow, you know, depending on how prolific your progeny is, um, that could be a lot of people and even three generations. I mean... Oh, sure. Um, I... I, I often joke. I mean, I have, I have very large families in my in my both sides of my mom and my dad's side, and I often joke that I'm related to half the people in Utah because I probably am. Um, <laughs> just the way that families intermix and and relations. I mean, it's really fun to do if you're into genealogy. Is figure out how big families get over a certain period of Amazing. time. How big your family has gotten. Um, the smallest it could possibly be is, you know, one at each generation. And that's not, that's not hard to handle, but the way most families replicate themselves, you could end up with a very large group of people at the end of three generations. Do you have enough wealth to justify a trust Mm. to be maintained for the benefit in such small fractions for that size of a group of people? Most people don't. Even with really great investment management. Right. Most people don't. If you're sending out any money at all. Right. Um, it's probably going to exhaust itself. So mm-hmm. realistically speaking, most trusts exhaust themselves over time. Um, it's only the very well endowed trusts or sure. large trusts that makes perfect sense that can even last into perpetuity. But you still, but if it made it to a third generation, that would be pretty impressive. Yeah, that would be powerful. And then, and then, we will often give what's called a power of appointment. How um, does that work? Powers of appointment are basically a right given to a person in the trust, could be a beneficiary, could be a trustee, could conceivably be someone outside the trust, to redirect how that trust is to be disposed of at at a specified point in time. So Mm. what the most common type of power of appointment is a special or limited power of appointment, and it's usually testamentary, meaning it doesn't come into play until someone's dead. And it's exercised through the will. So you give your son or daughter a limited power of appointment in your trust or will. After they've, you know, benefited from their trust for their lives, they can then treat that asset as part of their estate and direct its disposition however they want. So if they didn't like all the conditions and terms and incentives you put in your trust, they can take that and incorporate it into to their estate planning. They could leave it outright if you give them the power or leave it outright to their kids or they could design their own trust around that uh, um, power of appointment and leave it to their kids with different conditions, different incentives. That's really powerful. So there's a lot of flexibility here. It seems like I could be able to come into you and, and talk to you and say, you know, this is my general goals, my general feelings. And you would help me figure out the right tools to make that happen. That, that's exactly right. And that's, I think, an important thing for people to consider because the idea of estate planning is could be daunting or overwhelming. Yeah, sure. To say, well, um, I, you know, I, I often joke that I've never had someone, I've only, well, it's happened now once, but rarely do I ever have someone come up to me and say, I'd like to do a sale to a defective you know, intentionally defective grantor trust. What did you just say? Right. right. Or I, I'd like to do a charitable remainder unit trust because they don't know these tools. They don't know how they work. They don't know they who exist. Who is that person that's asking you for that? Right. Um, they're usually people who are, have a lot of time on their hands and they're just surfing the internet for ideas. They've read ideas. too much. Um, I do not require my clients come to me with a um, fully developed uh, estate plan in mind. I, mm-hmm. I, I do exactly what you're describing, which is say, what are your goals? What What's the outcome you want? What do you s- want to see at the end of the day? And I'll help come up with the infrastructure. I'll put the bones on it. Um, you tell me what you want to see as a finished product in terms of its effect, its impact, 
what are your concerns um th- that's the job of the advisor if you if you find yourself a good advisor the job of the advisor is to figure out how right. we just want to know what what do you want to have happen who do you want to benefit how do you want them to benefit what are your concerns about what you're leaving behind are you concerned that someone does have a, a weak marriage or someone has a weak spending constitution that they're they're liberal in their shopping habits you know we can address all those things we've um you know the more experience the more of these plans you have under your belt the more problems you've seen arise right. and you, you can get get that too as a financial advisor um we're not psychologists we don't solve the problems yeah. <laughs> we just help plan to make uh the estate planning situation a do no harm and if we're lucky we've enhanced the outcome a little bit that's a that's a great point you know my um oldest american relative was a a guy named henry alt and he came over an indentured servant and so did his future wife and they had nothing obviously being indentured servants they worked out of their slavery and ended up with an estate that you can now google and you can see what they took care of in the in the Revolutionary War. He was, you know, we're we're sons and daughters of the American Revolution, and nine generations have passed, and nothing but that legacy of his story remains. Right? Nobody still has right. the the wooden, you know, the wooden tools or the or the anvil that he used to to build what in you know in, in 1800 when he passed was a was a sizable legacy. So Nate, I, I'm 100 percent sure that you would agree with me when. When I say the the following statement, knowing you like I do and having as much respect for you as I do, that money in alignment with your values and your goals and your relationship, it's an unalloyed power of good. It does good things for the world. Yeah, absolutely. And and as I think this is somewhat to what you're alluding to, um, the estate, the wealth that you leave behind is only a piece of is only a part right. of the total legacy exactly. of an individual. Um, and so, yeah, try not to get wrapped around the axle in terms of... Right, of the dollars. The dollars. It's the stories. And, and, it's, the, it's the memories. It's those, the yeah, those else. certainly should not be forgotten. Although I will say, um, I'm also very cognizant, very respectful that every estate is someone's entire wealth, mm-hmm. right? Whether that's... A, a modest estate or a very robust estate. It's still everything that person has worked to accumulate and deserves the attention necessary to, to make sure that their, for lack of a better phrase, blood, sweat, and tears that went into that is treated as they want it to. Again, I don't view any succeeding generation as having a legal claim on the efforts and, 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 um, product of their parents' lives. Um, that, that's not meant to be a, a disrespect to any children. It's just, it's reality. And so the parents should not feel they have any duty or obligation other than to what their conscience tells them to when they're setting up an estate plan. Nate, I couldn't imagine leaving it with a better thought. Thank you for your expertise today and, and You're your welcome. time. I really enjoyed this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else. And join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expertnetworkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented, nor does it constitute legal investment or accounting advice. And the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through ANI Financial Services, and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.